Need a search engine optimization SEO? Need a search engine optimization SEO services? Then get in touch with our professional and friendly team to learn more about our range of custom and tailored services designed to suit your exact needs. Every one of our professionals have acquired years of experience, which ensures you get the very best. Our experienced staff is waiting to hear from you and to answer any specific questions that you may have on how we can meet your needs. Just ask for a consultation and let us prove our commitment to you as we promise to maintain the highest level of quality and commitment. Your satisfaction is our prime concern. So please, don't hesitate to get in contact with us and let us show you all the great options we have. And we are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Radio Network at coalitionradionetwork.com, facebook.com slash the Coalition Radio, on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio, and of course the mothership at coalitionradio.us, where you will find links to our Spotify, our Facebook, our YouTube, our Spreaker, literally just about any way that you can disseminate information about liberty, about art, and about culture. It is my great pleasure tonight to reintroduce someone to the show who appeared earlier this year in our ode to, if you will, both the immigration crisis and a important crisis happening across America. So that officially renders him what we lovingly refer to as frequent offender status. Jacob Hornberger, of course, is a candidate for the President of the United States and currently for the Libertarian nomination for said office. He's a trial lawyer based originally born out of Laredo, Texas. He's a founder and president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, a nonprofit educational foundation whose mission is to present the principled case for the libertarian philosophy and which as a nonprofit foundation does not endorse his candidacy or other candidacy. He's also the recipient of the LP's Thomas Paine Award for Outstanding Communicator of Libertarian Principles. Jacob, welcome to the coalition for the very first time, if you will. On an independent awesome basis. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me, Pat. Well, we've been looking forward to this for quite a while. For the record, over the last week or so, we've uh, invited and we ex continue to extend the invitation open to serious libertarian candidates uh, for the presidential nomination. The point of the show is to spend an hour or so, as little or as long as a candidate wishes, to really give them an opportunity to develop for folks their philosophy, how they arrived at their libertarian moment, their stands in detail on the issues. Clearly, and for full disclosure, I am the chairman of the Rhode Island Libertarian Party. This show is independent of that. So clearly, I, I am part of the liberty movement. But with regards to all third-party candidates, the rules of the coalition are very, very simple. We celebrate the independent candidate in America, libertarian or otherwise. I consider it a principled act of patriotism to engage in a challenging, difficult hunt for elective office for the opportunity to participate and protect the rights of the ultimate minority, which is, of course, the individual. But here's our take. We don't ask candidates about their fundraising. We don't ask them about their polling. We don't ask them if they're going to win. We frankly simply want to know why they should. So in doing so, we steer away from what I call outrage porn. And outrage porn loosely has been referred to as clickbait or operation change the subject, where media interests or cynical political interests will elevate questions that are largely based on emotion, vapor issues as a local political leader used to call them, in an attempt to either obscure, obfuscate, deny, run away from the serious issues of the day and in doing so preoccupy, if you will, the citizenry in acts of nonsense. I'll always illustrate whether or not an American Marine should have held a, an umbrella for then President Barack Obama. And, and people were outraged over that. And it took up three or four or five days of heated debate across social media, talk radio, street corners, coffee shops, while simultaneously government was engaging in, well, what government usually engages in, which is the nefarious subjugation of our civil and human rights. 
And after that was done, I don't even remember what was, maybe it was Shark Week that week. I'm just not sure. But that's our approach to programming here, and that's our approach to how we do everything here. So again, thank you for joining us tonight, and, and what I hope, I guarantee will be a great conversation. I met Candidate Hornberger for the very first time at the Vermont Libertarian 2020 convention. And what was remarkable was, number one, that he drove all the way to the Libertarian convention in, in Vermont, uh, along with Mike Rinaldi, who's also a Rhode Island Libertarian, um, but walked into a room filled with Libertarians, a quiet, a, a great bunch of people, and when he left, they were roaring, ready to take on, ready to challenge the omnipotent state. And that's what I said, I had to get you on the show. Um, let's start from the very beginning. Now, you've, uh, you've written a book about your experiences as a young man, as a, as a trial lawyer in Laredo, Texas. Um, but tell us about, tell the folks who may not have a chance to read that, about your upbringing, your father's influence as an attorney, your love for the law, and, and, just a, a, and, and what led up to your libertarian moment. Okay, well, first of all, I, I didn't actually drive to Vermont. I flew there. Oh, okay. uh, right after the <laughs> Illinois Convention, early in the morning. Uh, just, just to clarify that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I grew up on a, on a farm on the Rio Grande in Laredo, Texas. Oh, it was a farm in which you know we had crops. My dad was a lawyer, but he used the farm as a hobby. We had a horse that I'd ride down to the river sometimes, and we had uh, a few cows and ducks, and we had some wild hogs, and it was a very unusual way of being brought up. We hired illegal immigrants from Mexico. And when, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. I mean, since, this, since the first time a teacher said, write an essay on what you want to be when you grow up, I, I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, I'd go to the courtroom with my dad, and I'd see all the lawyers going into that little swinging door that would go into the, where the judge sits and the clerks. And, and I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And that's, I just wanted to do that and, and try cases. I mean, that was my dream, to try cases. So I ended up graduating from high school there in Laredo, went to college at Virginia Military Institute, got a BA degree in economics, got commissioned as an infantry officer in the reserves. I went to law school at the University of Texas. Um, I was right in the middle of that, and I had to drop out to go to infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia. And then I had a couple months left over, so I waited tables in Dallas at a restaurant there. And then finished up law school and returned to Laredo and started practicing law with my dad. And I was a Democrat. I mean, my dad was a Democrat. I grew up as a Democrat. In the fifth grade, I was out at campaign headquarters in Laredo stuffing envelopes for John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. And it was an exciting campaign. And my dad later took me to, with a bunch of other men from Laredo, to the LBJ Ranch for a barbecue there where I shook hands with Lyndon Johnson himself. And, um, but I was, I got really disillusioned. I got involved in politics in Laredo, Democratic Party politics. And yeah, I just didn't like it. I didn't like all the backbiting and this, and the double crossing, the double dealing, and the, all the stuff that comes with politics. So I said, you know, the heck with this. So I went to the public library to look for something to read in the political science section. And lo and behold, I see four little different colored books on the <laughs> bottom shelf. And so I pulled them out, and they were called Essays on Liberty. And I started reading them, and they were just hardcore, pure, no compromise, uh, hard-hitting essays on libertarianism. They had been published some 20 years before by the Foundation for Economic Education in New York, which was the first libertarian think, uh, educational foundation founded in 1946. And I started reading these things, Pat, and I was just bowled over. I mean, I, I mean, the scales were dropping from my eyes. I'd never read anything like this before. I was so shocked, but it, it felt like it was a road to Damascus experience. I mean, essays like people like Ludwig von Mises and Leonard Reed and, uh, I mean, hardcore stuff. Um, and so I checked out all four books, took them home and just was shocked, poured over them, then started looking for books by the authors in the books, going to Laredo Junior College Library, looking for things. And, and uh, so that was my road to Damascus experience. That was my discovery of libertarianism. And it changed the course of my life. I immediately put away all my trial books. I was about 29. I'd practiced law about four years. And I'd been studying books by F. Lee Bailey and 
um, you know, lots of uh, uh, um, lots of other trial lawyers in the country. I put them all aside and just started buying every single libertarian book I could find and and reading and studying it, and it became the passion of my life, which is the title of my book, My Passion for Liberty. I've got a couple of quotes of yours that I want to run by you, and I'd love to have you develop on them. The first one, the lesson that Americans today have forgotten or never learned, the lesson which our ancestors tried so hard to teach, is that the greatest threat to our lives, liberty, property, and security is not some foreign government, as our rulers so often tell us. The greatest threat to our freedom and well-being lies with our own government. Tell us about that. That's a bold statement. I agree with it, by the way. But it's a bold statement. Well, it is. And the, the, our American ancestors understood that, that throughout history, uh, people had lost their liberty, not so much to foreign regimes invading and conquering their lands. I mean, that certainly happened. But most of the time, they would lose their liberties to their own government. And especially during times of crisis or emergencies where people get scared and the government says, well, I'm here to help you. And it'll be only on a temporary basis that you'll just have to give us your liberty for a while, but don't worry, we'll restore it to you. And so when the Constitutional Convention was meeting in Philadelphia, it was for the purpose of just amending the Articles of Confederation. Now, what were the articles? Well, they were just a, a, a type of governmental system where the federal government's powers were very, very weak on purpose. Because, again, it reflected this mindset that our American ancestors had after they broke away from their, their, their regime of the, the English Empire. And the federal government's powers were so weak, it did not even have the power to tax. Imagine that, living under a government, a federal government with no power to tax for more than 10 years. So, but there were problems. There were trade wars between the states and so forth. So, so when they go to, to, to Philadelphia, everybody thinks we're just going to amend these articles and fix them. Well, they come out with a brand new proposal called the Constitution, where the power the government did have the power to tax, and so people were very leery. They said, "No way, uh-uh, we're not going along with this deal," because they considered the federal government would be the biggest threat to their freedom. Well, the the it was sold to them with the idea that look, that can't happen because here's the charter, and it says these are its powers. And the powers were very enumerated, very limited. And people said, okay, we'll go along with that. But only if this document is amended immediately after ratification. And so they went ahead with that deal. And so that's how we got the Bill of Rights, which really should have been called a Bill of Prohibitions. Like the First Amendment prohibits Congress and implicitly the whole federal government from destroying freedom of speech and freedom of the press and the right to assemble, freedom of religion. Well, the reason they felt that was necessary is because they knew the federal government would do those kind of things. You know, you don't you don't need those restrictions if you think the federal government is going to be nice and benevolent. And the same with the Second Amendment. that They knew the federal government would start taking away people's guns. And the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments, these are all saying if you ever target us, federal government, with, with coming after us, this is what you have to do. You have to guarantee trial by jury of citizens, no, no military tribunals, no judge trials unless we opt for them, right to counsel, all these barbed wire entanglements. Well, the whole idea was this government is the greatest threat to our freedom. And that's what's been lost in this country. I mean, once, once America converted in the 20th century to a welfare state and to a warfare state, or what we call a national security state, People started looking at the government as their God, as, as their daddy, their parent, that the government's here to take care of you. We're going to provide your retirement and your health care and your education. We're going to keep you safe from all those terrible, na- nasty tyrants and monsters overseas. And everything changed. At that point, people traded away their liberty and for the pretense of security. And of course, as we're seeing now, they ended up with neither one. Great segue, because the next quote I'm going to ask you about, contrary to popular opinion, the Constitution was not and is not a grant of rights to the citizenry. Instead, the Constitution is a barbed wire entanglement designed to interfere with restrict and impede government officials in the exercise of political power. What role 
does a Constitution play, as opposed to what some would define as natural law, in framing and defending human rights and liberties? Well, it plays a tremendous role because what the purpose of the Constitution was was to call into existence a federal government, but one whose powers were limited to those enumerated in the document. Now, this is totally different from the traditional concept of government. If you go to Europe, for example, there is the, the police powers doctrine, where the government has what are called the traditional police powers. And, and these are the powers that state governments have today. That was what the 10th Amendment was all about, is that the state government shall have the traditional historical police powers unless it's expressly prohibited in the Constitution. Uh, now, what we're talking about is the power to legislate for what has traditionally been known as the, the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the people. Now, that's an expansive view of the police powers. I would limit it to just punishing murderers, rapists, thieves, and so forth. But the traditional verbiage is health, safety, morals, and welfare. Well, to sell the Constitution to the American people, the, the framers, the, the people at the Constitutional Convention said, look, there's gonna, we're not going to have traditional police powers for this government. You don't need to worry about this government becoming tyrannical through the use of police powers, as, as many of the state governments are now doing, and, and local governments as well. You got all these little mini dictators coming out in the states and localities. Um, that instead, this is a government of enumerated powers, and here are its powers. Now, now, Americans were still not satisfied with that. They were very leery. And so they said, uh-uh. Okay, we, we like that. We like that enumerated powers, but let's just be safe here. This is what you cannot do. And that was what the First Amendment was, the Second Amendment, Third Amendment, and then Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth, and Eighth was if you ever target us, you're going to have to go through these barbed wire entanglements. And oh, by the way, the Ninth Amendment is, says that even though we've enumerated some rights in here, like freedom of speech and freedom of the press, that doesn't mean that we've covered them all, that this is not an all-encompassing list. So you can tell the spirit that went into this. People were very, very suspicious of this federal government, a mindset that is totally different from what we have today. Or as the Obamanistas would have you believe, it's your federal family, not your federal government. <laughs> um, <laughs> folks point to, in particular, the First and sometimes the Second Amendment as being under attack. And by that, they're implying both through the culture, the media, uh, society in general. Which, which, of, which of the constitutional uh, elements do you believe is actually under the most vicious attack? I'll have you go first, and I'll tell you what I think. I, for me, there's just no doubt it's the Second Amendment. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, the right to keep and bear arms. That I, I really think the Second Amendment should, be, should have been made first. Uh, because without the Second Amendment, the First Amendment becomes worthless. And so does the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments. That what keeps these people honest, and see, the, our ancestors were right. You cannot trust these people. They, they will seize every opportunity, and especially during crises and emergencies, to destroy liberty. And they've done it throughout American history. And as uh, an author named Robert Higgs, a libertarian, has pointed out in a book called Crisis and Leviathan, every time there's a crisis or emergency, they, they exercise these dictatorial powers, and when the crisis is over, they never return back to the original spot before the crisis. So there's this ratcheting effect. With each crisis, you lose more and more of your liberty. Uh, but, I mean, I look around, and, and boy, there, the Second Amendment is under assault everywhere. Here in Virginia, the governor, who is a Democrat and a Democrat-controlled legislature, I mean, they almost made it a felony to own an assault rifle, uh, where you were, were you would be required to just get rid of your assault rifle, maybe even by turning it in. And then they, they, they were going to settle for, well, you, you can just go register it, where they keep your list, a list of, of all the gun owners, and we know where that leads in an emergency or crisis. And finally, you know, that was blocked. I don't know how it got blocked, but there was a massive protest in Richmond that scared the dickens out of them. And then there was sheriffs all across the land that said, we're not going to enforce this crazy law. So they finally dropped that, but they've just adopted a whole host of gun control restrictions. And we see this all across the country. The, the right to keep and bear arms, our, our ancestors understood, is, is the linchpin of a free society. Uh, you, if, if 
Americans ever turn in their guns to the government, it will be the last time they make that mistake because the government will never let them have their guns back to make it a second, a second time. I'm also a believer that the Fourth Amendment has been just devastated in, in, in the, the last few years, particularly at the Supreme Court level, which leads me to just kind of a, a challenge here. One of the reasons why one element of the duopoly was elected in the past uh, four years was to be their quote-unquote protection of the Supreme Court from an activist court uh, status. And yet, simultaneously, when you look at these erosions of liberty post-crisis, it really is a shared responsibility by both elements of the duopoly, isn't it? I mean, both parties have rigorously, given the opportunity, given the seat of power, given control, haven't they been equally brutal in attacking our civil and, and, and personal rights? Oh, there's no question about it. And I totally agree with you about the Fourth Amendment. I mean, it's been eviscerated, especially with the war on drugs, this evil, destructive, racially bigoted government program. Um, and, you know, I don't really look at it as two parties. I, I look at it as one party divided into two wings, sort of the, like the NFL's divided into two conferences. <laughs> it's the Welfare Warfare Party, and they have two wings, uh, Democrats and Republicans, and they compete for power. And it's musical chairs, they exchange places and so forth, but they share the same overall philosophy. So it doesn't really matter which one gets in. I mean, Donald Trump has turned out to be nothing more than a continuation of the Bush Obama administrations. And he's turned out to be no different from what Hillary Clinton would have been when, if she had been uh, elected president. I mean, both of these parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, are equally responsible for the destruction of our liberty the destruction of our, our prosperity, our health, our well-being, uh, they bear equal responsibility. That's why I take I have a beef with, with libertarians that, that look more sympathetically at the conservatives or the Republicans. Yeah, I sometimes yes. hear, oh, our conservative cousins. Well, they're no cousins of mine. I mean, I, I, think, I think that conservatism is as dis morally uh, disgraceful as progressivism is. Yeah, I... Um... Full disclosure, I took a little bit of a heat at a, a, a recent meeting of um, one of the good parts of the governing party, uh, body, if you will, of our, of our party, uh, when I mentioned that I wasn't aware that there were any principled Republican conservatives uh, in our government, at which point in time I was um, made sport of by a number of people, but I will stick to that point until I die. Um, ultimately, I see the evisceration, as you so aptly put it, of our rights as just sort of a continuing cabal who, as in the words of the immortal Jerry Seinfeld, you have elements of people who are just rooting for laundry at this point. Um, do we live in a permission society, do you believe? Absolutely we do. You have to get permission for almost everything. I mean, th this is a society in which the government is the master and we are the servant. And a good example of that is the income tax. I mean, there, there is no way to reconcile an income tax and an IRS with a free society. America lived without income taxation for more than 100 years, and along with all the socialist welfare state programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education grants, the whole kit and caboodle of them. I mean, charity was 100% voluntary, and people decided what to do with their own money. And, oh, they also had lots of savings to get them through a an emergency or a crisis, unlike what we have today. Um, but that inverted the whole relationship of master and servant in American society when they adopted the income tax. It, once the government wields the authority to take whatever it wants from you, either directly through the Internal Revenue Service or indirectly through the Federal Reserve, the citizens became the servants. And, and it, now it's just a matter of, of um, will they be nice to us? Look at licensing laws. In order to pursue an occupation, which we libertarians say is a right, you have a right to sustain your life, to go out into the marketplace and engage in any occupation or profession, any vocation, uh, leave it up to the consumers to decide who stays in business and who doesn't. But you've got this protection racket called licensure from the top, you know, lawyers, doctors, hairdressers. It, it's to protect the elite, the people that have the money that can pay for those extensive courses over several years, very expensive courses, to protect them from competition. Uh, look, look at uh, immigration control. I mean, here is a fundamental right to pursue happiness. Jefferson says it adheres to all men. 
Uh, it's not just Americans that have a right to pursue happiness. And peacefully crossing a border doesn't violate anybody's rights, but people have to ask for permission. May I come in to this country? May I go get a job? Uh, I mean, th this is what's happened in our country. And, and here's the real, the real core of the problem is that people are convinced that this is all freedom, Pat. I mean, yeah. it, this is this is the plight of the American people. It, it was summed up in the words of Johann Goethe. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Powerful words. And and by the way, I, I just have to take an aside, and it's folks who listen to the show regularly hear me say this all the time. The type of attack on the, I'll call it the day-to-day -day lunch pail freedoms, licensing, state in involvement in free markets has cost us dearly at this moment in history. And, and let me briefly explain why, and I love your reaction to this. The licensing issue has greatly diminished our, our ability for medical expertise to travel across borders, not foreign and abroad, but domestic. The ability of a doctor to simply pick up in Arizona where they may have been spared some of the harsher elements of this, this disease, this pandemic, to go to New York or go wherever he or she is called by their avocation, their profession, their life's learning, and engage in healing has been sharply controlled. The, the, the intrusive nature of government with something as benign sounding as certificates of needs has eliminated a free market presence to build up using their own risk capital, which would have given us additional capacity to, to fight this dreaded disease. The FDA, an out of control FDA, who sees itself as a gatekeeper to life at this point, who is more intent on f avoiding lawsuits than actually promoting the efficacy and safety of an individual drug, has kept us years away from a potential cure and developing a technology for a potential cure. It's, it's, it's disgusting, and it's real, and it's killing people. And yet those, Jacob, are the very claims to support life and to be fair that government has been injected into our daily life. What, what are your thoughts? Am I, am I rambling or do you think I'm on target? I think your words are very profound and, and they reveal a very, very keen insight into what is happening here in the healthcare industry. I've been saying for 30 years at the Future of Freedom Foundation where I serve as president and which I emphasize does not endorse my candidacy, that the root cause of America's healthcare crisis is government involvement. And specifically, bef before the coronavirus crisis, Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, and, and of course, this shocks people. Oh, my gosh, Jacob, how would we survive with all this? I mean, this is what socialism does. It's like a narcotic. It makes you think that you can't live without it. But I grew up in the, in the poorest city in the United States, Patty. That was Laredo, Texas in the 50s and 60s. That's what the Census Bureau said. <laughs> and it was poor. I mean, people lived in shacks. And there were doctor's offices that were filled every day. And, and the, doc the doctors knew that most people couldn't pay or many people couldn't pay. It didn't matter. There was never a case where a doctor turned away any patient, senior, poor people, for inability to pay. They just handled it for free. They knew that. Now, sometimes people would bring in tamales or whatever, but most of the time the doctors knew. And nonetheless, the doctors were still among the wealthiest people in town, second only to the oil people because taxes were low still. The welfare state had not gotten really going, and neither had the warfare state. So, I mean, this is what a free society is all about. Healthcare costs were so low and stable that it was like going to the grocery store. Nobody had major medical insurance. You didn't need it. I mean, how many people have, you know, grocery store insurance to protect against bankrupting grocery prices? Nobody. That's the way healthcare was. Doctors loved what they did. There were innovations. There were inventions taking place on an exponential level. Then comes this artificial government system, Medicare and Medicaid. Oh, we got to help the seniors. The seniors were doing fine because healthcare costs were so low. Like I said, nobody needed insurance. But this massive demand on the system ruined everything. And that was the beginning of the perpetual crisis. And we have to keep in mind that there was a big healthcare crisis before this coronavirus. I mean, that's why they enacted Obamacare. That's why they were moving toward fully socialized medicine because of the crisis. I, we published a book in 1994 called The Dangers of Socialized Medicine, saying there's one solution to this. 
get government out of the of the healthcare industry. Then healthcare costs would plummet back to normal levels. But you know, of course, you know who listened to us. And right. then the the coronavirus crisis hits, and you have a and it reveals another aspect of this, the one you're pointing out. You've got what is called a centrally planned healthcare system. Uh, that's as compared to a free market healthcare system. You've got the the Centers for Disease Control, the FDA, the government's task force on the coronavirus crisis, Health and Human Services. Everything's planned in a top-down uh, system. Now, why is this a bad thing? Well, central planning is the core element of socialism. This is what the Soviet Union was all about. So when you see shortages of masks, shortages of testing kits, shortages of ventilators, this is classic central planning. When you see the chaos that's going on, Ludwig von Mises called this planned chaos. And then you, you've got uh, all these little tyrants coming out. I mean, the DNA, the dictatorial DNA of Republicans and Democrats is coming out big time. Because when central planning fails, they the only thing they know how to do is turn to tyranny. Now, notice that we libertarians propose not that we would be a better central planner. I mean, clearly Donald Trump's turned out to be a horrible central planner. Uh, they told him this thing was coming. But we don't purport to be better central planners, at least I don't. Uh, I say, vote for me, not because I'm going to be a central planner. Uh, vote for me because I'm proposing to you a different system, a free market system. Uh, now, imagine if you'd had a free market system where there's no government involvement at all. We would be looking to the healthcare industry for leadership and guidance to face a health threat. Uh, there would be mult a multiplicity of testing kits, maybe two bucks each, uh, then Amazon would be flooding every home, 50, 100 testing kits. Everybody would be testing. You could isolate the people that were sick. Everybody else continues working. I mean, there's a dynamism that takes place in a free market, that a spontaneity that can never happen in a centrally planned system. Uh, let me give you just one example of this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a, a, a brewery called Dogfish Head Brewing Company, and they, they brew beer. And there, there's a great video op-ed, three minutes long, in the New York Times, and I highly recommend everybody watch it. It's by the, the president of the Dogfish Head Brewing Company. He said, in, as soon as this crisis is going, they notice that there's this shortage of hand sanitizer. And he says, hey, we, we produce alcohol here. That, that can be converted to hand sanitizer. So they converted part of their operations to, to the production of hand sanitizer, and they start flooding hospitals with dogfish head hand sanitizer. And the hospitals are so grateful. And, and he says, we didn't do it for free because I got a payroll to meet. Uh, we were charging for it. And, but then he ends up making a profit and donates his profit to a fund for hospitality workers that are out of work. Well, do you think a central planner, the Centers for Disease Control, would have ever sat there and said, well, Dogfish Head Brewing Company could do hand sanitizer. Not going to happen. Instead, you have this mindset of President Trump that says, I need ventilators. I'm going to order General Motors to produce ventilators. Well, that's contrary to the principles of freedom. and It's contrary to the principles of what would happen in a free market. There's a tale out there, whether or not it's true or not, I've never been able to verify. When Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States and he allegedly toured an American supermarket, and as the tale goes, he wept because he saw this incredible range of, of products and from around the world at prices that, you know, you could only get if you were an apparatchik or when were able to shop at, say, the dollar store, ironically, in, the, in Soviet workers' paradise. And suppose, as this tale goes, he wept in, 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 in both wonderment and astonishment and, and sadness for his own people. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know about that story. In 2020, because of this chaotic intrusion by government over a series of years, we now find ourselves with the spectacle of Americans starving, waiting in soup lines, empty supermarket shelves, and farmers throwing out milk into fields. Now, I, I'm not going to blame any one individual for that. But something is amiss when we've gone from arguably the greatest free market engine in the history, literally the history of man, to the point where Americans are dying 
because of their inability to get a tongue depressor in effectively included in a testing kit. That's how full circle we've come. And while it's not the fault of one, it's a responsibility of many. Which, which, which brings me up to a question I've been dying to ask for a while. I want to be careful how I phrase this. So you'll bear, have to bear with me. There are many folks in our movement who have what I'll call a pragmatic inclination. They will point to the difficulty in, in, in the quote-unquote world of implementing the very type of the vision, if you will, for a free market that folks like you, myself, and, and so many libertarians pine for. And in doing so, they'll actually, I believe, tacitly imply that these principles are almost irrelevant. And that while we may speak to them elegantly in a statement of principles or in a platform, that we can't certainly, we cannot rise up and actually demand them. We cannot, as a collective group, dare I use that term, argue for them. What do you say to that? Yeah, well, first of all, let me comment on your uh, your point about the Soviet Union because it's so revealing. I mean, the, the the U.S. has gone in that direction of central planning, so you end up with these same types of shortages you had in the Soviet Union. And I I just happened to re to see a um, a little vignette of Ronald Reagan jokes on the, about the Soviet Union. And I, I and I had just forgotten how effective Reagan could be. I mean, this guy was just he could be a really funny guy. And he told the story of a of a guy. He, he says, Gorbachev told me about a guy that called to order a car. And uh, the car dealer says, well, well, we can have it ready for you 10 years from now on this date. And uh, so the guy says, morning or afternoon? <laughs> and the guy says, well, what difference does that make? And he says, well, I've already got the plumber coming in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. I, I think you have to be of a certain age to understand that. What was the, what was a great moment with uh, Johnny Carson? He had, uh, he was talking about uh, Brezhnev and, and Reagan, two 90 year old men willing to die for their country. I, you know, it doesn't, um, there's, <laughs> there, there's, there's a shared history. I think you and I have of, uh, you know, events gone by, but what are your, what are your thoughts in terms of the, the, the obsession with some to diminish our appetite to bring to fruition our beliefs because it's, I, it, I think it can't be done. I think it's one of the most fascinating phenomena in both the libertarian movement and the libertarian party. I mean, I've been accused in this political race that of being too radical, and which is kind <laughs> of sorry. interesting. I, it's bizarre because <laughs> nobody nobody is saying that I hold any views other than libertarian views. I mean, you know, all my views are libertarian. So when they say that I'm too radical, what they're really doing is saying libertarianism is a bad philosophy because they're condemning the radicalism of libertarianism. And, mm -hmm. and it's really weird to me because, you know, we have, I think we've got the greatest philosophy that mankind has ever seen. I mean, this is a exquisite philosophy. It's, it's consistent. It's the solution to the woes that afflict America. I mean, this is a life or death decision now. This isn't some esoteric debate. Uh, right. we're, we're talking about an economic system that's dysfunctional. We can see that now where people don't even have savings to get them through one or two months. I mean, imagine that, the irony, the war on poverty. And look at all these impoverished people that don't even have savings to get them through an emergency. And then you've got a dysfunctional health care system. You've got a dysfunctional monetary system. It's all coming together in a perfect storm. Our philosophy is the way out. But you've got libertarians that have come that are in the party and in the movement that say, well, people just won't listen to us if we if we give them the libertarian message. They'll be shocked at this. Uh, and so we need to give them the Republican message. That's usually the line. Now, sometimes they'll say we need to give them a Democratic message like we need to give them welfare. As long as we promise them that we're not going to dismantle the welfare state, they'll be happy with us. Or on the Republican side, as long as we 
support you know the the income tax and economic regulations and immigration controls and foreign interventionism but just do it a little bit less we'll get votes well my position is so what i mean suppose you get the votes what difference does it make you've gotten the the votes on on misguided principles it, partly even deception i mean because you're leading people into thinking that you stand for something when you really don't and I, I really don't think it's effective uh, in convincing anybody because all they have to do is go to the party platform or to the principles of libertarianism and see uh, what our principles are. When, when I first discovered the, when I first joined the, the, the Libertarian Party in 1990, it, a guy named Bill Evers called me up. He was an activist out of California. And he asked me to join the platform. And I said, nope, not going to do it. And he says, why not? And, and the platform committee. And I said, because this is just a political party and you guys are watering down principles to get votes and I'm not interested. He says, well, have you ever seen the, the party platform? I said, I don't need to. I know what it says. It's just a bunch of ad hoc positions designed to get votes because you guys are scared to death that you might not get enough votes and you have to water down the principles. And so he says, let me send you a copy of the platform. Would you read it? And I said, yeah. Well, he sends it. Pat, and I started reading this thing, and I was stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I mean, this was a pure libertarian manifesto. Uh, I mean, like, down the line, purist. And, man, I called him up, and I said, well, if you'll still have me, it would be an honor. And that's why the party's called the party of principle. But what, what's happened over the years is that we've attracted a lot of Republicans, disgruntled Republicans, which, which is great. I mean, I love to see the party growing. But the problem is a lot of those Republicans come with baggage that they don't want to let go. And so instead of letting it go, they come in and they say, look, guys, if you want to get political success, you have to adopt our principles from the Republican Party. Well, I, and they were doing this on the platform committee. There were even people saying to us, we need to abolish the platform because people are discovering what we stand for and it's hurting us on the, on the campaign trail. And Evers and I took the position this is our insurance policy, the platform. It protects us against LP candidates that are out there espousing views that are not consistent with this party. This is our protection. And so over the years, look what's happened with, with the libertarian brand. It's become a hash of Republican and, and, and libertarian. You've got lib Republicans that feel like they can walk into our party and like a farm club or a little revolving door uh, because our philosophy is become a hash consisting of republicanism and libertarianism when really our, our our brand is totally different and and that's what i want to restore here i want to restore what our brand is it, it is a radical philosophy but it's a good philosophy it's a solid philosophy just a lot of these people they don't know how to they don't know how to defend our philosophy uh, there's an old saying that nothing worse can can befall a good cause than to have it ineptly defended but one of the funniest things I hear in this race is when somebody says, Jacob, you're going to cost us votes. We need to water down the message here. I mean, what's the point of that? If you got to deny your essence, deny who you are and become somebody you're not, uh, I got to wonder, you know, I got to wonder about that methodology. I say, let's be true to ourselves. Let's get out there and fight as libertarians, fight with our principles. If Voters reject this. Well, that's just the way life goes sometimes. But at least you still have your integrity intact. I would rather have that perhaps that smaller percentage of individuals who listen to our platform, our statement of principles, for whom it resonates at some level with, as people to go into battle with, to be in that, uh, to be in that trench with, and then grow from there as a movement, than to consistently water down, homogenize, boil out any substance, any passion, any discipline. I, I, it, 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 it absolutely confounds me. Our attraction as a philosophy became clear to us in Rhode Island in, in our, one of our first active elections just a couple of years ago. We had some wonderful local candidates running for state house, and folks constantly remarked to us that when they had the opportunity to ask them a question— the answer was forthcoming, if for no other reason that there wasn't any second guessing, there was no finger in the wind, there was no polling, 
There was no oppo research. It was simply you looked at an issue and you responded through the prism of your libertarian belief system. It's, it's, it's really that straightforward. Folks, if you're just joining us, Jacob Hornberger, he is a candidate for the presidency of these United States. The candidate for the libertarian nomination is joining us tonight for a full hour or so. We spent the first half hour just going some some musings, if you will, on philosophy. We are the coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media, broadcasting live on the worldwide coalition radio network here at coalitionradionetwork.com, facebook.com slash the coalition radio, on the mighty, mighty Twitter at coalition underscore radio, and of course the mothership at coalitionradio.us. If this is the first time you might be listening to us, thanks to the good graces of Mr. Hardberger's appearance, I'd ask you if you could take a moment, follow us on Facebook or like us or, or subscribe to us on the YouTube or Twitter. Uh, for independent media like this, social media promotion is our mother's milk. It's what we depend on to sort of rise above the white noise that is the sort of lazy, homogenized commercial media today online. Again, Jacob, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's in the, these, are, these are challenging times. I'd like to spend the rest of the time I have with you going over really specific issues. And, and first and foremost, uh, not only because of its exigency related to the corona crisis, not only because of the war on drugs, but by the simple fact that you grew up, and you alluded to it earlier, you grew up on the border with Mexico. Your, your family is steeped in its history, both as farmers and as, as part of the social fabric of Laredo, Texas, as, as trial lawyers. Um, again, let's, let's not soft pedal this tonight, right? <laughs> let's talk about your thoughts on our immigration system and the, and the rights of people to free egress and the rights of people to, to really uphold their property rights. Tell me where you're coming from. Yeah, first of all, if I may, I'd like to address that last point you made because it, you hit the nail on the head, Pat, that a, a campaign that's based on libertarian principles is a campaign, I think, that charges up your base. That In any campaign, you have to have a base that gets excited. And, and you know, how many people are going to go to the barricades for the sake of a cost-benefit analysis or a <laughs> white paper study? You know, it just doesn't happen. You, you go to the barricades because you want to go for liberty and, and you're fighting for rights and so forth. And I, I think one of the cardinal sins of politics is to run a boring campaign. And I, to me, a Republican light campaign is totally boring. Now, you may reach more voters, but you lose your base uh, because I'll always vote libertarian. There's no doubt about it. But when I see a Republican light uh, candidate out there advocating nothing but Republican light positions. I yawn, but boy, and, and I don't care if he gets 10% of the vote. I, it doesn't matter to me because I still don't get excited. You give me a libertarian party candidate that gets 1% of the vote that's out there expounding pure libertarian principles, man, I, I will donate to that guy. I'll work for that guy. I mean, that that's all that matters to me. Charge me up. Uh, and, and, that's what I think is needed in this presidential race. I think this party needs a candidate that's going to charge up the base, and then we go into battle. Okay, um, on immigration, I, I grew up with with seeing this immigration crisis uh, right up close. I mean, this is a border town. The, the immigration service was everywhere. And this is the thing to keep in mind about the immigration system we have, because there's candidates, uh, even in this race, at least one, that supports this system of immigration control. There's an important thing to keep in mind about this. An immigration control system always comes with a police state. It's like lightning and thunder. You can't say, well, I, I, I favor the immigration controls, but I oppose a police state because that's like saying I support lightning, but not thunder. They go together. And I, and I saw this police state up close. Now, what we have here is a socialist system, just like the healthcare system. It's a centrally planned system where the government is planning in a top-down fashion the number of immigrants from each country, what their credentials are, the qualifications, the total number. I mean, this is classic central planning. So lo and behold, you have these dysfunctionalities. You have people backed up at the, at the border that want to get in to work. You've got crops over here in the, in the United States uh, that are rotting in the fields because they don't have enough workers. I mean, 
This is classic central planning. But, it, but because it doesn't work, because people find ways to circumvent the controls, then that's where the police state comes in. And I've, I've had experience with the police state. I told you that we hired illegal immigrants. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, we, we hired about, I think it was about seven or eight or so on our farm. I worked in the fields with them. My brothers did too, especially in the summers. We'd play football with them after work and before dinner. Um, and then, you know, but the immigration service can, can, under immigration controls, can trespass onto any farm or ranch on the river and even near the river. We were on the river. And they just come into our, our property, the Border Patrol, without a warrant uh, because they're controlling the border and they can drive all the way down to the river. If we put a lock on our gate, and didn't give them a key, they would just shoot off our lock. And so one day they busted our workers. Usually our workers could hide when they'd see them coming in, but this time they caught them. And it was a horrible day. I mean, I was in high school. My, my brother was in junior high. My younger brother was a lot younger, but we were all with tears. I mean, these guys were our buddies and our workers and stuff, and, and they were carted, cart, carted them away. It was a profound impact on me. I mean, I, I really detest the Border Patrol. This is one of the most corrupt, tyrannical agencies. And they, they go into ranches in South Texas. They leave gates open, which is a cardinal sin among ranchers. Uh, and so then you've got also uh, highway checkpoints, where even if you never go into Mexico, you are subject to a complete search east-west on the interstates. And then you've got uh, them boarding Greyhound buses. Uh, you've got, and, and we have a, a nanny that we grew, we grew up with. She still lives in Laredo. She's 91. When she takes the bus to go north to visit my brother in San Antonio, she has to carry her passport because they won't let her go through. She's an American citizen. Uh, she can't speak English, so they, if they, she doesn't have her papers. So this is the tyranny of this system. I mean, it's horrendous. You have also roving Border Patrol checkpoints where they just stop whoever they want. And I've been the victim of one of those when I was in high school. This guy just turns on his light and I pull over and he says, open your trunk. And I said, well, for what reason? I mean, this guy, this is a border patrol. This isn't a cop that's like charging me with, spe uh, with speeding. And he says, don't you know the drug problem down here? And that's the other half of this tyranny is the drug war down there. And uh, I said, you don't have authority to look into my trunk for or drugs. He says, well, I'm looking for illegal immigrants and I've got that authority. So this is what we live under down there. It's a police state. There's only one. Oh, and then there's the death and the suffering. And, and, and a, you know, like there's a, a photograph on the internet of a man and his three-year-old daughter, their bodies on the shores of the Rio Grande, you know, trying to cross over and then people dying of thirst in the American Southwest on the deserts there in the back of 18 wheelers. I've seen this all my life, and it, it's a horrendous, immoral, evil system. And how anybody can defend this system is just beyond me. It, it just boggles my mind because our heritage is open immigration. We had an open immigration system for more than 100 years where people are free to cross borders back and forth. They retain their citizenship. They don't have to become American citizens. They work up here seasonally. They make a lot of money. They go back home. Uh, and... Immediately, nobody cares what the citizenship is. At that point, you're just dealing with human beings. I mean, today, when you interact with people, you don't know what their citizenship is. Who cares? And it's a free, a free market uh, immigration system is a humane system. It's consistent with religious principles. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself with economic principles. It's, it's the finest system ever invented. And, and look at domestically, we have open borders. And it's the only solution that, that will resolve this crisis. Just dismantle ICE, dismantle the Border Patrol, Immigration Service, open to the border, the free movements of good services and people. There is no other solution to this crisis. I agree completely. I, uh, I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is not a border town. Um, so my, my references, sadly, are somewhat limited. But uh, I always reflect when the conversation comes up on this show on the, uh, the extended weekend I spent with Dan Fishman and Tom Mann down in Deming, New Mexico. And, and, and just, I love your reaction to this. A couple of things that became apparent right away was that for folks who actually live there, not weekenders, not people like myself who were just parachuting in to look at a situation for the first time, but for folks who actually live there, the border largely is, is just, it's, it's, it's almost transparent to them. 
you know, the children in, in there are parts of Mexico where children in Mexico pay for their education at American public schools in New Mexico. There are there is constant flow of trade. There's constant flow of of people and workers. And yet, you're right. I mean, we we had to pull over for one of these stops near you know in, in north central New Mexico. You know, hour and a half, two hours away from the border uh, through a, a temporary stop that was built. Uh, we went through the border. We spent time one of the afternoons actually chatting with folks who were trying to get over the border as part of the refugee surge. And, and we met with, as I always say, we met with a group of people who were from Cuba who had somehow managed to get from Cuba to the New Mexican border, which most people would agree is something of a trip, something of a walk. And the, the driving force for these people, and, and you can call me naive, I don't think so, but the driving force for these people, all of whom had skills, was simply a life away from the dictatorship in, 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 in Cuba. And in folks we met who had made it over our side, a life away from the narco-terrorism that is the inevitable result of a failed American foreign policy and drug policy. I, 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 you, you brought up the war on drugs, and, and that's another hot point for me. I mean, ultimately, what we do here, as I often reflect is that we have offshored the production of our drugs that we have an insatiable appetite for here in the United States, and in doing so, have moved, say, in the days of the Volstead Act, moved away the criminal element from Chicago or Boston or New York City, and instead we've moved it down to Central and Latin America. Our failed foreign policy and our policy on drugs is directly responsible for upheavals in people's lives, murder, across... Most of the southern, most of the southern border, as I always say, we have seen the enemy, and he is us. I mean, how much of the chaos that results from from our border problems, some of the public health crises that have resulted from it, uh, from from children and families, children moving alone, off in the United States, the these horrific detention centers that you see along the border. We were there in Deming to visit a privately funded. Uh, refugee processing center where people walked in, and through the good graces of a lot of volunteerism, people were given showers and basic medical treatment and, and new clothing and, and were fed for a couple of days before they journeyed northward as legal American refugees, might I add. But how much of that, how much of that chaos have we created ourselves here in the United States, in your opinion? Yeah, well, I, I, it's funny you mentioned those detention centers. Uh, I used to go into those things. When I got back to Laredo to practice law, I went over to the federal judge in town and I'd known him as when he was a lawyer because I was a kid and my dad was a lawyer. But I made an appointment to see him and I said, Judge, I'd like you to appoint me to represent illegal immigrants and I'll do it for free. And this was in federal court because I, I, I told him I wanted to question the constitutionality of this whole crooked system that I thought was un, being unequally applied. And he said, fine, I'll do it. And he started appointing me to represent these guys. So I walked into a uh, detention center, and and this was before I discovered libertarianism. But this is this was planting a seed in my mind of there was something wrong going on here. Because remember, I was a Democrat. I believe that government should be helping the the poor, needy, and disadvantaged. Well, as I'm sitting there waiting for my clients, and it, and it it, ha it has the feel of a Nazi concentration camp, you know, with barbed wires and on the it's open. I mean, but with with a fence around it with barbed wire on top, sort of like a, a Nazi concentration camp. And, and everybody's just milling around, you know, nothing to do. There's about 150 people in there or so. And it just hit me. Like, well, wait a minute. If Democrats love the poor, needy, and disadvantaged as much as they say they do, why are they jailing these people? This, this is the poorest people you'd ever find. All they want to do is work. And I remember going and asking a couple of liberal friends of mine, I said, hey, how do you reconcile this? And they said, well, the law is the law. And I said, well, yeah, segregation was the law. Slavery was the law. Uh, and I couldn't figure it out until I discovered libertarianism. And then everything falls into place. that This is a, a bad, bad, immoral system. And you hit the nail on the head, Pat. I mean, this is the, the supreme irony of this. You have advocates of immigration controls that say, oh, we, we got to keep these people out. But then they favor this vicious, destructive war on drugs along with foreign interventionism. Let's not forget all the stuff the CIA and the military have done over there where they foment coups and revolutions. And I mean, you've got 
all this massive violence in Latin America that is owing right now mostly to the war on drugs. I mean, in Mexico alone, there's like 70 or 80,000 dead people, not because of drugs, but because of the drug war. When, when I was a kid, we could we would go on dates in Nuevo Laredo. Now, we, we didn't have parental consent, and neither did the girls, but we would sneak over there and just not tell our parents there was no drinking age, and there was nightclubs and sh- all kinds of great stuff. And uh, we, we had a great time, and it was always safe. Um, and when we come back, the, 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 fortunately, the, the immigration officials there would never, you know, card us or check us for D, DUI or anything. But, I mean, we weren't, like, totally drunk or anything. But, I mean, nobody would do that anymore. Uh, it's too dangerous because of the war on drugs. And, and that's one of the precipitating causes. You know, is a digression. That's exactly what's happened in the Middle East and Afghanistan that the massive interventions that the U.S. government has fomented there brought about these huge flows of immig- immigrants into Europe. And, of course, then the state is saying, oh, Jacob, what are we going to do about all these immigrants? What are we going to do? Well, maybe you ought to stop invading countries and killing people, and maybe you ought to stop with your drug war. Maybe you ought to get rid of the CIA. And then all of a sudden, immigration flows become more normal, more natural, uh, instead of people fleeing for their lives. Yeah, we were treated here in a case recently where a, a gentleman had left, I believe it was Nicaragua, um, literally in the middle of the night. His home had been raided by state police. Uh, there, was, there was gunfire involved. A state policeman died. They accused him of being the cause. He made it to the United States. And then Attorney General Barr seems to be uh, uh, obsessed with returning this gentleman to a country for whom he will certainly be killed by. Be killed by, and and yet, because of this, of of this obsession with demonizing one individual part of society, who, by the way, statistically commits crimes at a lower rate than Americans, who, by the way, is a significant part of of the American agricultural system, who, by the way, has provided low directly across the border manufacturing here in 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 this hemisphere, who, by the way represents a significant part of our population now, um, is all of a sudden they are, they are evil and they're bad hombres and they're alluded to, uh, assignations are made between them and gangs that simply don't exist. And, 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 and who, who is ultimately paying the price? Not only are they, but we as American citizens are. In, in, in a militarized police, uh, military, heavy militarized police society that we're you know, planting into dropping like a bomb into our middle cities. And then we're, we're, I'm sorry, inner cities. And then we're shocked, shocked, I say, by the increase in the explosion of crime as a result of the conflict between inherent between an occupying force representing a police department. I, you know, it, it's the, the I, I guess at this moment, I just have to ask you, it, the answers to, and I bring this up in a reflection to the first part when I was talking about a pragmatic approach, a careful approach, or in the words of the great comic, wouldn't be prudent, all right? The answers are so simple and straightforward. There are a half a dozen things we can do in this country that would instantly make the world a better place. One of them is ending the war on drugs. Number two is creating an open border and, and, and allowing people to work wherever they want to and who, for whom they choose. Simply doing that could change the world. Why don't we do that, Jacob? Because you have vested interests that are making a lot of money off it and, and, and getting power from it. Uh, drug lords and drug gangs are the last ones that won drug legalization because they'd be out of business overnight. J- just mm-hmm. like when prohibition was ended, uh, all the Al Capone gangs went out of business overnight because they can't compete in a legitimate market. And the same with the, the, the drug war bureaucracy, the federal judges, the state judges, the, the prosecutors, the sheriffs, the DEA, they've got mortgages to pay. And so they, they need these jobs, the court clerks and so forth. And, and I think that's the major reason why this war goes on. You've got the drug war bureaucracy and the drug lords that are just too powerful. And, and Congress just will not do the right thing. Now, now, we've seen movements at the state level toward legalization of marijuana. But, you know, you still got all these drug lords and drug gangs. And it's because of, of the drug war. You know, it's so ironic. I've seen these drug prosecutions, Pat, for, you know, my entire, well, all my life, really, since my dad was a lawyer. He was a U.S. magistrate, 
And um, sometimes I'd see him when he'd have these hearings back in the 60s on, on um, drug defendants that would be brought before him. Timothy Leary was brought before my dad when he was arrested <laughs> in Laredo. And I went, my very first case that I tried in federal district court, a jury trial, was a drug case. I, I fought the DEA. They were framing uh, my client. It was an appointed case. I was representing the guy for free. And, uh, and the jury acquitted him because they, they recognized that the DEA was trying to frame an innocent man. And so these prosecutions have been going on for decades. To what avail? You've got federal judges that have slapped people with maximum sentences. There's, there's a case in North Carolina that I learned about in this campaign where a black man got a 200-year jail sentence for a nonviolent drug offense at the state level. Uh, the penitentiaries are filled with, with blacks for the drug war. It's, it's really what, what Michelle Alexander, the noted academician, calls the new Jim Crow. It, it's a vicious, vicious system. Asset forfeiture. I mean, they're making a lot of money off that. Why would they give up the drug war when they can be out stealing people's money under asset forfeiture? So... Ameri this this is something Americans are going to have to do some soul searching on. I mean, your point is very good about the the drug war, the immigration service. Uh, the third one, though, and it would be very e easy, as you point out, all you got to do is repeal these laws that criminalize this conduct. But the third one that we cannot um, avoid talking about is the the interventionism. I mean, notice mm -hmm. that in, amongst amidst all this death and suffering here at home that you've got this national security state that continues to wreak death and suffering to people in the Middle East and Afghanistan and Africa. I mean, it's just nightmarish. This is a death machine. That They're not cutting their expenditures, expenditures. I guarantee you that. They're dropping more bombs than ever. They're san sanctioning people. In Iran, Iran's got the, mo the highest degree of this coronavirus in any nation in the Middle East. Infections, cases, and death toll. They're pleading Please lift these sanctions, because even before the crisis, they were they were gasping uh, for air because of these sanctions. And now with with the coronavirus, the sanctions are just decimating them. And you talk about shortages of this and shortages of that. It's it's what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil, that where, where good people do evil things and think they're doing good. I would bring all the troops home immediately from everywhere. Stop foreign interventionism. It has nothing to do with protecting the United States from invaders. Nobody's invading the United States. Bring them home and discharge them. Totally stop this whole system of foreign interventionism. Lift all sanctions and also the embargo against Cuba, which uh, to me is bizarre that that thing is still going on. That's just weird. Um, lift them all and then you start establishing harmonious relationships with the people of the world instead of this conflict, bombs, do as we say imperialism, militarism, uh, sanctions, just get rid of all that stuff. And I'd even go further than that. I'd say dismantle the national security establishment, which is this alien form of totalitarian governmental system, and restore what we talked about at the beginning of this show, a limited government republic with just a basic military force. Now you're talking about those three things. You're talking about really making some advances to a peaceful, harmonious, prosperous, and healthy direction. You know, it's just a reflection on Iran. There was a, a remarkable moment for me, and I, I I don't consider myself a student of history. I'm no expert. I, I literally try to play one on the radio, right? But the, I, I am a fan of history, and I consider myself relatively well-read, nothing special. And when, I guess it was Soleimani who was executed by American while he was involved in some type of mission on foreign soil, foreign soil to Iran, that is, and immediately the cheering started. And so I just started to ask people, I, you're, you're cheering. We executed uh, essentially a foreign leader um, without due process, without trial. Any of the niceties that we claim that your political affiliation drapes themselves in the American flag and the Constitution, I would have thought that would have been important to you. Well, and here's the killer point, right? Well, since the mid-70s when Iran decided to start attacking us and our people, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This all began in 1953 when the American Civil, uh, Central Intelligence Agency removed, I guess what you would call the equivalent of a democratically elected leader in what was then now called Iran. It had nothing to do. 1976, in the mid-70s, 
and the hostage crisis were a direct reaction to the installation of the Shah in Iran. Well, that was uh, 40, 50 years ago. How could that matter? Really? So if, if, if a state had executed Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s, you'd be okay with it because enough time had passed? It's this almost criminal, criminally negligent ignorance of fundamental facts of American history, which is sometimes good and sometimes quite sordid, that is, I think, the most disturbing to me. Because we live in an era now where facts don't matter. And what's the old line? You can have your own opinion, but you can't have your own facts. Well, it appears now that as a direct outgrowth of the current administration, you can now, believe it or not, in fact, I, I think, Jacob, if you go down the store, you can buy your own set of facts. Because facts don't matter. Science doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter anymore. How, do, how can we possibly overcome a culture which has embraced a sociopath who clearly just kind of makes it all up as he goes along, which would be funny, except he is, in fact, the president of these United States. What do we do? Well, I'm really glad you brought up the assassination and that you're as morally outraged about it as I am. You know, in the early days of the CIA, they, they always had the power of assassination. I mean, and, and prior to the establishment of the national security state, which took place after World War II, uh, the, United, the U.S. government never had the power to assassinate. You know, we talked earlier about the Constitution setting forth enumerated powers. There is no power to assassinate people. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the, the, the Bill of Rights says no, no life, no person should be deprived of his life without due process of law. And due process means a trial and, and conviction and so forth. So here they are now. And so from the very beginning, once they, they, trans, um, they converted the federal government to a national security state, the CIA was claiming the power of assassination. But they were keeping it real secret. It was, it was almost like this sub silencio deal with the American people that we'll have to do some dark, sordid type things, but we won't tell you about it. We'll keep it secret so that your conscience doesn't bother you. And so in 1952, they were already developing an assassination manual, and you can see it online. And, 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 and it was also explaining to the trainees how to disguise the role of the CIA so that people couldn't see that the CIA was involved in the assassination, like throwing somebody off the uh, high story building, a hotel or something like that, where it would look like a fall. So all this is in the manual. And then, of course, they, they targeted people with assassination secretly. Uh, Fidel Castro, a country that had never attacked the United States. And it was all just like considered normal when it came out, except Lyndon Johnson, I mean, with all his faults, he did point out that the CIA was running what he called the damned murder ink in the Caribbean because that's what it is. Assassination is murder. And so they, when they murdered Suleiman, I mean, it, it was just shocking, just incredible. And, and all designed to protect American troops in Iraq. Well, what are American troops still doing in Iraq? Iraq never attacked the United States. They never invaded the United States. I mean, what's that all about? So it, it's this whole dysfunctional system. But what's interesting is a lot of these people that support this stuff, they go to church every Sunday and, and they, they just wear their religion on their sleeves and they support what's going on with the, uh, the immigrants, all the death and suffering in the police state, uh, thinking that they can sort of reconcile it with God's second greatest commandment. They've got the, they, a lot of them profess, well, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life. Well, well, they're pro-death overseas though. Like they, they celebrated this assassination of this guy uh, and I'm glad you pointed out the history of Iran and the United States because, you know, the, the, the people have convinced themselves that Iran is the aggressor, that we're just like, defending ourselves. I mean, this is ridiculous. Iran's never invaded the United States. As you point out, the CIA went in there and destroyed their democratic system, destroyed it. And it puts in the Shah. The CIA trains his secret police force, the Sabak, in assassination, torture, uh, all the, the art of tyranny and oppression. And finally, when the Iranian people revolt against this tyrant, the only reason they took the diplomats hostage is because the Shah was in New York getting treated for cancer. And, and the Iranians thought that the U.S. was conspiring to bring him back. And so the, the hostages were there saying, you ain't going to bring this guy back. And unfortunately, the Iranian people were never. A, now I'm not defending what they did, but I'm just trying to explain what their motive is. 
And then, um, unfortunately, they were never able to restore their democratic system. They end up with as big a tyrant as the uh, as the Shah. But the CIA has never forgiven them. I mean, the, the, the CIA, that's what this is all about. Regime change. The same thing as 1953. That's what the sanctions are about. That's what provoking war is all about. Let's put our puppet back into power. This, this is this is evil stuff, Pat. Speaking of dysfunctional systems, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of a little story about our educational system, and I'd love for you to reflect on what you see as a direction that we should take as a country. Uh, imagine this. Uh, my daughter, I'll just admit, that, uh, attended a, a, a local all-girls school. And uh, when you and I, Jacob, were growing up, I think a lot of young women, and some men, but a lot of young women, took French. Okay? That was a romantic language. It was one of the primary languages, if you will, in Europe and across the world. And it was, there was a certain romance to it, right? We had baguettes for the first time, and we, you know, the, the, the young women we went to high school with waxed romantic about going to Paris someday, right? And, well, French is on the wane. It's, it's no longer the international language it, it once was, and um, it, there's less interest in it. So at uh, the school my daughter graduated from, um, they had these lovely young teachers. A lot of folks don't realize it. A lot of foreign language teachers in this country, particularly in the dreaded private school environment, are of Middle Eastern nature. And, and that's because it, it's such a polyglot. Of, there's so many languages spoken there. And this uh, lovely woman who is Syrian, who, while she was teaching my daughter, uh, had family come over and stay with them as refugees from the Syrian Civil War. That's another story. Um, she who was a French teacher. And so someone had the idea, let's start an Arabic program. You speak Arabic. You're a highly accomplished, certified teacher. So about a year later, they started an Arabic program. My daughter went into high school. She had four years of high school Arabic. She placed out of a first semester Arabic course at an Ivy League university and now works in a related field, ironically helping disseminate, uh, cross-disseminate, if you will, American Arabic publications, you know, classic works of literature that have been cross-translated. And despite her rather socialist upbringing, she's actually starting to act like a libertarian, talking about how governments get in the way of the exchange of free ideas. If my daughter had attended a public school, I would posit to you that there would be five years of fulminating and ruminating about what type of uh, cl class to put together, three years of lawsuits, two years of discussion about whether or not we were elevating folks, five years, two more years or whatever of troglodytes who were worrying about the institution of Sharia law through my daughter's Quaker prep school, and maybe you would have had an Arabic class. To me, that sums up the... The, the, just the entire level of dysfunction that occurs between privately sourced education and public education. My, one of my favorite hashtags, you talk about <laughs> probably upsetting the mm, more pragmatic aspects of the libertarian movement. One of my favorite hashtags is end public education. I just kind of lay it out like that because I believe we should end public education. Now, if I could find a place right now to move millions of American children into another school like tomorrow, i do it. What are your thoughts about the educational system in this country, our approach to it, our public funding of it, and the not-so-enviable results? What, what are your thoughts? I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it is a totally dysfunctional system. We've talked about central planning in this, in this program. This is another example of it. It's a, it's a central planning system that involves the federal government with the Department of Education, but then you've got the state governments with their departments of education, and then the local regime, which are the school districts, which are central planning. I mean, the, the school boards are government officials. Government te school teachers are government employees. It's, it's a government bureaucracy. And, and I, don't, I don't criticize any of the teachers or the administrators. My, my sister was a public school teacher. She taught fifth grade. My niece was, a, uh, her daughter was a public school teacher. When I practiced law, my dad and I represented a school district. So these are all good people. But when you have a bad system and good people, the bad system's always going to win out. And why do you have a bad system? Well, because, again, it's based on central planning, based on coercion, uh, the, the mandatory attendance laws. You have to submit your children to, the, to this state system and, or a state-approved system. 
And most people, of course, default to the government schools because they can't afford the private schools. And then you've got compulsory funding. I mean, this is the recipe for a dysfunctional system. And worst of all is what they do to children. I mean, every child from zero to six has an absolute natural love of learning. And you can see it on kids' faces. I mean, their eyes are this big. They're, they're absorbing everything they see. They, they're just, all they want to do is learn. Uh, they, they bedevil their parents with that horrible three-letter word, why, 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 you know, until the parent goes crazy, leave me alone. But then by the time that kid gets out of high school, all that love of learning and awe of the universe has been smashed out of him. All, all kids want to do is get out of school. They hate school. That's not normal. That's not natural. The natural thing is to love learning all your life. Uh, and, and some people never get it back. They did it to me. I mean, I admit that I was a victim of this system. When I discovered libertarianism, boy, that's when I got my passion for learning back. I mean, most libertarians are self-taught because they're not going to teach libertarianism in public government schools. So what's the solution to all this? Well, it's the same solution we've been talking about here at the free market. The free market produces the best of everything. It would produce the best education, entrepreneurs, educational entrepreneurs, rushing into the market to provide parents with choices. Here, do this, this, this. Maybe even workplace schools where kids take, where parents take their kids to the workplace and there's really competent teachers there that, it, that the companies have hired. Uh, I mean, you just don't know what a free market's going to produce. What we do know is what happened with, with churches and religion, that when, when our ancestors were faced with the choice of having public churches, they said no. We're, we're going to get keep government out of religion entirely. And I'm sure there were people that said, oh, well, where will the poor go to church? Well, today you've got plenty of churches and the poor don't have any trouble finding churches to go to. Well, the same thing would happen in education. You separate school and state the way we separated church and state, um, a total free market uh, educational system, no compulsory attendance laws, no school buildings run by the government, no school taxes, everything free market. How would the poor get that? Well, you've got uh, scholarships, wealthier people willing to help out the poor and the needy with scholarships. You see that all the time. You'd have schools that would cater to the poor, uh, just like restaurants cater to the poor. It would be the greatest system ever. And the ones who would benefit are the people in the inner cities that pay the biggest price for this dysfunctional system. And, and, and that really is the perfect point, the perfect stopping point, if you will, in, in this entire train of conversation. Because ultimately, the term that, that I've heard that I think is the most poignant is when people talk about the soft bigotry of diminished expectations. The very folks that suffer the most, whether it be poor public schools, minimum wage, excessive regulations, zoning laws, crony corporatism, economic racism, all of this, are the people on behalf that these programs are placed on. We do this to be fair. We do this to help the poor, the children. And yet, the lives that are most diminished are those very people. Because in doing so, we fail to allow them the freedom to make their own decisions. We don't trust them enough to control their own lives. And I can't think of a more bigoted, racist notion than that, that somehow you can't run your life, therefore it is up to me to make decisions on behalf of you. And... The, the, the sum of all this evil has resulted in that very impact on a significant, significant part of our population here, a significant part of our citizenry, a significant part of the people who try to become citizens here. And that's why I believe that the word fair is, is perhaps the dirtiest, the most obscene four-letter word in our language, because there is absolutely nothing fair about trying to be fair. Um, it, it's, it's, which is why I guess the, the last thing I'm going to challenge you with is I believe incrementalism is the devil. I believe that incrementalism just perpetuates and perpetrates bad endings for a, a whole lot of people 
in those very communities. That the notion that somehow we can soft shoe our way into these solutions is, 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 is a fraudulent conceit. What do you think? Well, let's go back to slavery. Let's say we live in 1855 America. Mm -hmm. And there's a libertarian that comes up to you and says, Pat, I got an organization formed here uh, that's working toward the reform of slavery. And we're going to get laws enacted at providing for shorter work hours, uh, better work conditions, better food, fewer lashings. And by the way, we're also going to gradually reduce slavery over the next 30 years because it would be cruel and inhumane to, to just free these slaves all at once. They don't have a work ethic. They don't know how to get a job. And so we're going to gradually and incrementally reduce slavery over the next 30 years. Now, my hunch is that you would have the same reaction that I would. I would say, that doesn't really interest me. But if another libertarian came along and said, Pat, I've got an organization here that wants to end slavery immediately without any delay, without any hesitation. I believe in freedom. God has created resilient human beings. You can free all these people today and everybody would be fine. My hunch is that you would say, where do I sign up? And I think that's the point you're making on this incrementalism and reform business. Great conversation. I, 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 I can't tell you how grateful I am that you chose to spend, spend some time with us tonight. Um, I think that pretty much sums it all up. How can folks find out you, about the Jacob Hornberger campaign? I'd like you to engage for the next couple of minutes in what we call here lovingly shameless self-promotion. <laughs> yeah, I, I just would like to wrap this up to follow up on a point you made that what we really sure. need in this country is to recapture a faith in ourselves, a faith in others, a faith in freedom and free markets, a faith in, for me, a faith in God. I mean, we've lost that faith. Our faith is in the coercive apparatus of the state. And so that's why these trillions of dollars are being sucked out of people's pockets and put in the hands of the bureaucrats and this fake false charity that comes with the IRS and coercion. We've got to recapture that faith in ourselves and in freedom in others. Uh, if people want to learn more about my campaign and they want to come and support me, uh, go to jacobforliberty.com. That's our website. Uh, you can see our upcoming appearances. We have lots of podcast interviews like this one. This is one of our best, I got to say. You, you, I want to tell you how grateful I am for letting me talk as much as I want and explain my positions. It's very nice. And uh, we've got media interviews. We've got articles. We've got live streaming every Tuesday night. Ask me anything. We've just come out with a brand new professionally produced two-minute video advertisement called End the Wars that I think libertarians will absolutely love. And that's at the top of the blog section of jacobforliberty.com. Uh, so yeah, I, I greatly appreciate your support. I, I hope to win this nomination. I would love to take this battle using our libertarian principles against Donald Trump and Joe Biden. They got the money, they got the power, but we've got principles, we've got ideals, we have sound ideas on liberty. I'll put those up against all the money and power any day of the week, Pat. I, I can't resist one last um, shot out there into the, uh, into the libertarian universe. I'm sensing that if you get the opportunity to spend a half hour with Rachel Maddow in prime time, that you're not going to vouch for a failed duopolist, are you? <laughs> I don't think there's any chance at all that I'll ever vouch for <laughs> any of those people or their crooked and corrupt system. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Folks, we are the coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media, Broadcasting live on the Worldwide Coalition Radio Network. Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio. On the mighty, mighty Twitter at CoalitionRadio.us. And of course, the mothership at CoalitionRadio.us, where links to this interview will be up shortly. This will reside for a couple of days on the Facebook, at which point we'll put it up on our YouTube channel. We do broadcast to YouTube and to, to Periscope. If you have a moment, folks, all we would ask is this. If you could... Like us on Facebook, follow us on the Twitter. If you could take a moment, if you have a YouTube account, to, uh, to subscribe to us there. It's critical to us because, as I said in our, in our break, independent media relies on social media to, to take conversations like this and elevate, elevate them, if you will, above the white noise 
of the white noise. We'll just leave it at that. Folks, have a wonderful evening. We're going to take a, a little bit of a break here. We're going to come back in just a couple minutes, and um, we're trying to experiment, Jacob. We, uh, we believe that we might be the first call-in libertarian talk radio show in the world. So we're going to open up the lines. There'll be a phone number up there. I know this is kind of revolutionary for libertarians. It doesn't involve a chat room, but you could actually call and argue about with the, about whatever you want, particularly tonight, especially if you're one of those folks that wants to take it one step at a time. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for joining us. Need a search engine optimization SEO services? Then get in touch with our professional and friendly team to learn more about our range of custom and tailored services designed to suit your exact needs. Every one of our professionals have acquired years of experience, which ensures you get the very best. Our experienced staff is waiting to hear from you and to answer any specific questions that you may have on how we can meet your needs. Just ask for a consultation and let us prove our commitment to you as we promise to maintain the highest level of quality and commitment. Your satisfaction is our prime concern. So please, don't hesitate to get in contact with us and let us show you all the great options we have.